Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Stephen Gould from Golden Moon Distillery here in Golden, Colorado. Um, welcome to Gymposium uh, 2020. Um, obviously, this is not what we originally planned. We originally planned to get together in London and sip a little gin and talk about a little gin and learn about gin and all things gin. But uh, the world has sort of changed for all of us. And so we're doing it remotely. So I'm sitting uh, in still house number one here at Golden Moon Distillery uh, with a couple of our small uh, stills that we use for specialty products and that we prototyped uh, most, of our, most of our products on behind me. Um, we do have a still house next door that's much larger, uh, but this is a nice backdrop and it's a comfortable place. And so welcome to a little piece of Golden Moon Distillery. Uh, I'm joined uh, by my friends, Bernadette uh, Pimplin and uh, David T. Smith. Uh, both wonderful gin experts and um, fellow gin geeks. Uh, the other members of the panel that we'll be reviewing tasting notes from are uh, Dr. Ann Brock, uh, who couldn't be with us today from Bombay, where she's the master distiller. Uh, Alice Pearson, who is the R&D director for Cotswolds. Uh, good friends of ours, good friends of mine. Um, Christine Sherry, who's the editor of Master of Malt and used to be the editor of the Spirits Business Magazine. Uh, and of course, uh, David and Bernadette. So um, what we've done is uh, we tried to select a family of gins that I, since I was asked by the Gin Guild to, to curate this discussion, felt truly exemplified the American gin experience. And so what I looked at was a broad spectrum of gins made in the U.S. that I, starting with some of the earlier craft distilleries uh, that are still strong and still well represented, uh, that really I felt was, was a, a cross spectrum of different styles and tastes and takes on what a gin can be. You know, the, Amer the, the modern craft distilling movement in many ways came from the United States and is still, uh, at least pre-COVID, uh, moving rapidly. We have about 2,000 distilleries here in the United States now. Uh, here in Colorado, where I'm sitting, we have 110 distilleries just in the state of Colorado. Uh, California, where, where one of the gins behind us comes from, uh, I think they're over 130 now. Oregon, where one of the gins comes from, I want to say they're in the 100, 120 plus at this point. So, you know, we really see that even as we're going through this pandemic and things are a little weird and we're all locked in, we're still seeing people opening distilleries. You know, the, the current craft and premium markets are, are, are down as far as volume, but that's temporary. and It's all gonna come back in some way, shape or form. It will not be the normal we knew before, but it certainly will be the normal. And if there's one thing that's constant, people are gonna wanna drink and people are gonna wanna drink gin. So with that, uh, I'd like to start by talking about uh, a gin made by one of the first craft distilleries in the U.S. Uh, at the time, it was called Anchor Distilling. Uh, it's now called Hoteling and Company. Uh, they developed their gin called Junipero. And Junipero is really a take on a classic London dry, but it's an American take on it. So this is the product. And I've been drinking this product off and on for, God, two decades. And it's an amazing product. It's well made. It's well balanced. Um, of all the gins that are on the table behind me, if I were going to make a classic dry martini, this would be the gin that I'd pull. What's the uh, ABV of that, Steve, please? You're making me work. So it's 98.6 <laughs> proof, 49.3% uh, alcohol by volume. Okay. Nice, fairly dry, but with, with, with some sweet undertones. Really love this gin. Now I'm biased. I love I love all the gins I picked. That's why I picked them. Um, when we get to mine, which we'll get to way at the end, I'm obviously way biased in that direction because I make it, but. Um, there's not a gin behind us that's a bad, that's a bad pour in any way, shape, or form. So with that, um, why don't we start with uh, Bernadette and 
let's talk about what you felt about Anchor to Stone. Yeah, or lovely. actually, okay. yeah, lovely. Um, firstly, I'd just like to say I'm quite a big fan of American gins. Um, I find there's like a, a real boldness to the flavors um and I, I just i really appreciate that it's just really nice um and there's an inventiveness to it as well and i kind of like the twist like you say it's a london dry but it's it's slightly removed from a london dry that i'd know the juniper in it is just oh it's, it's so loud and it's just really lovely and there's this sweetness um which i'm guessing is coming from the licorice as well um it's, it's a strange one. It's a bit of a paradox because it's got this simplicity to it. It's really centered around the juniper, but it still has these little bits of complexity to it as well. Um, so yeah, I, I really, really appreciate it. Um, well, it's soft in parts, but it's also punchy. Yeah, it's a very clever little drink, this. Yeah. So they, when they developed it, they really, they really, they very deliberately wanted to make it a juniper forward gin, mm. hence the name. Yeah. And um, they did they, they they experimented and found ways to get a fair amount of, of juniper essential oil extraction, and then they layered everything else on top when they did their R and D. So the entire intent was to be not a one dimensional juniper gin, but a juniper gin with complexity, but it was still was very juniper forward. Yeah, and it's really interesting because we were only talking the other day about how like in recent years there's this trend of it going back to being very juniper focused products. Um, so it's really interesting. This has been out for such a long time and it did this such a long time ago. Yeah, wonderful. So David, what do you think? Uh, I love this gin and I've liked it for a very long time. Probably was one of the first US gins I tried um, and I just think it's uh, marvellous. It's a high AB, ABV in comparison to a lot of gins that we get here and even what you get in the US. But there's a great integration between the alcohol and the flavor. And so it doesn't feel like it's quite that strong. You know, there's no harsh burn or anything to it. It's crisp. I like um, that little extra citrus that it has. Um, as drink wise, it's a fantastic all rounder. I mean, I, I think you'd struggle, as long as you know how to make a drink, you'd struggle to make a bad drink with it. But like you said, in a martini, uh, would be fantastic. And personally, I probably would have it from the freezer because I love that extra viscosity that that high ABV gin would have. Totally agree. Totally agree. So the next, the next notes uh, I'm going to read are Alice's, uh, who could not be with us today. And folks, I'm not going to say that every time I go to the town. <laughs> So, you know, she felt, uh, she said it was clear and colorless. Um, she felt it'd make an amazing martini. Uh, she loved that it had a light coriander note and the lemony citrusy character, but that it was a classic London dry gin profile. Um, she actually said it was a little hot on the nose, which, which is, I believe, what they were going for. Um, and, 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 oh, by the way, you know, when we get to my gin at the end, I was going for the same thing. And that's not a coincidence. Mm -hmm. When I decided to build my gin, I looked at the other craft gins that were on the market and Junipero was an inspiration in, mm -hmm. in, in, in no small part as to how I put together Golden Moon, which you'll taste later. They're very different gins, but the higher ABV that touch of hotness, because I think, and the folks at Anchor back in the day thought that higher ABV is gonna allow you to make a better cocktail. The mm. gin is going to shine through. And they did it very deliberately. And as a distiller, when I started making gin, I looked to this gin and said, ooh, I like that idea. So for the distillers that are listening out there, there's nothing wrong with taking inspiration from someone else's product. Not at all. So. Uh, it's interesting what you're saying about the ABV, because one of the things I noticed when I've come over to the US is that certain um, brands that are available here are available in the US at a higher ABV, so things like Gordon's and Bombay Sapphire and Beef, Eaty, Beef Eater as well, um, all available at higher ABV. I guess partly that's for the ability to cocktail with or make cocktails with them and the tax issue, I guess, as well. Um, absolutely. I don't think it's a tax issue because our taxes, they're not as high as Europe. Um, so the taxes here are lower typically than you guys face. Um, but the craft cocktail movement, um, and as, as we all know, and I'm going to say it again, not only did, cra is craft, did the craft distilling revolution essentially start here in the U.S. with distilleries like Anchor, but 
if the if America has one contribution to the co the culinary world, it's cocktails. Cocktails came from America. Um, now cocktails went through a renaissance uh, initially during American prohibition in Europe, but cocktails came from America to Europe. And the craft cocktail revolution that we've seen in the last 15, 20 years really also started here in the US and has spread globally. And so when you see the big brands starting to use higher proof spirits in the US market, it's because that's what the bartenders want because it makes better cocktails. Yep. So with that, um, we'll go ahead and talk about uh, uh, Christine's comments. Um, that's the, she said, and probably the, the one that, the, the comment that I liked the best that she said was that Junipero was immediately mouth fill, filling in Juniper forward. It's just like a big punch of Juniper at the start. Mm -hmm. Rich, spicy, suggestion of raisins, Licorice, grapefruit, wonderfully pronounced. Couldn't have said it better myself. Mm. You know, it's just really a, while having that classic gin profile, it's just really got a lot going on and it's really flavorful, but it's still a dry gin. Mm. So, and that's why, that's why 20 years on, we're still talking. About it. So next let's talk to, and last but not least, Dr. Ann Brock, master distiller at Bombay. And so she said, you know, it's got a sweet juniper freshness, bold without any astringency. And I think that's important. It's just, it's really big, but well balanced. Uh, the finish is really long, really smooth. Um, she says, and, 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 and this, is, this is the distiller in her, and I so respect this. This gin managed to walk, to, manages to walk the balance of having, a, having bold, powerful botanical notes without being harsh or overpowering. And that's why we're here. That's why this gin is what we're drinking. So any more comments from, from either Bernadette or David? Um, I'm reminded of one of the ways that Junipero was described to me the first time I tasted it. And someone said, it's like a London dry gin, went to California, got a suntan and did some weights. <laughs> I think that's quite a nice way to describe it. That's you know, that's great. that's great. That's great. It's you know, it's it, it, it's an American take on a London Dry. It's it is it is a London Dry, but it isn't a London Dry. Yeah. So it, yeah, it's very interesting as well because I kind of I, I, in my head I have American gins as being very bold. If you sort of say it's one of the sort of the earlier ones, you can see how a lot of people are, like you say have looked to it for inspiration, and it's kind of stylize this idea of gin coming from America. It's really cool. Yeah. All right, so let's move on. We're, we're going to move now to a gin from Portland, Oregon. Um, the gin was, it was developed in, and is still produced by my friends Christian and Tom at House Spirits. And this is Aviation. Of course, now owned by Mr. Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds. Uh, their sales are booming in, in Canada because of it. Um, again, I've been drinking this gin for a really long time. Uh, I've known Christian and Tom for a really long time. One of the funnest things I ever did with this gin was I was at Vin Expo Bordeaux about five years ago with Christian. And we were talking to Roberto Bava, who is the producer of Koki Vermouths. And we ended up sitting at this table with my gin and this gin and three different vermouths made by Roberto Bava making Negronis and just switching products in and out to see the differences. It was just a blast. Anyway, so Bernadette, let's start with you. Yeah, that's lovely. That does sound like a blast, by the way. Um, <laughs> so I, again, I'm really pleased with it. The lavender on the nose, it's um, potent but it's balanced and I find lavender is a bit of a tricky botanical. You can overdo it. Um, and this, the balance in this is really, really lovely. Um, the flavor, it's unusual. It's complex. There's the different elements, but they work very well together. Um, the finish, I found it lingered. It was Moorish. I've got a little hint of the anise as well, which was lovely. Um, interesting with bags of character. I suppose if I was going to put it in something, 
I would like something along the lines of like an English garden. Uh, if you kind of get these ideas of, of sort of cucumber and elderflower, I kind of think the lavender would go very, really well with that. David? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think the lavender's there for sure, but it's not, not too much. And um, a good mm. chunk of anise. I mean, that was something I definitely got, which also gives it a little bit of sweetness, which I thought was um, quite nice as well. Very much, um, whereas I feel like the the junipera kind of had like one foot either side of the Atlantic with what it was doing. This seems to me very much more of the modern kind of style um, of of gin. Um, and uh, but yeah, but you could still there was still some resinous, there was still some juniper. Um, I in terms of a drink i thought it was nice quite smooth neat but i also thought it would have some good potential in a gin old fashioned which i think is a drink that probably don't see people drinking that much but i think it, this could lend itself quite nicely to that nice well you know the this gin was actually inspired by a american pre-prohibition gin that was mentioned in the last cocktail book published before prohibition in the united states and it was published uh it was referred to uh, and I can't remember the name of the gin. I've actually got it in my notes, but the specific use of the gin, of, of the gin, it was in the uh, the rest of the aviation cocktail. Elbots, exactly. And so they wanted to make a gin inspired by this this recipe for the aviation cocktail in this pre-prohibition cocktail book that would work well in aviations. And I think they did it. I mean, as I said, I. I have all these gins on my home bar. I've got a lot of things on my home bar, but I've got all these gins <laughs> on my home bar. And I think they've done a wonderful job. I mean, this is sort of uh, the flagship for what some people in the gin world call a new Western style of gin. I mean, this is the gin that sort of created that style, if you will. And um, I mean, it's now a classic, you know, it's a craft gin. It's, you know, it's been around for a while now. Uh, it continues to grow in popularity and it continues to be used uh, by bartenders and consumed by gin drinkers all over the world. Um, and that's pre Ryan Reynolds buying it and adding his fame to it. You know, this was an amazing product that stood on its own for many, many, many years before Ryan got involved. And, you know, Ryan has, as he likes to say, he loved the gin and he was in a position to buy it. So he did. And it's been a very good relationship for the guys at House Spirits. And he's basically, it's been hands off in how they make it. And they're still making it exactly the way they always have, uh, which is a, you know, a, a, a cold maceration followed by a distillation. And um, they get a nice level of extraction and uh, they've got a nice palette of herbs and it makes really good cocktails. So with that, let's let's just take a look at what Alice had to say about it. So Alice had to say that, um, you know, she really loves that it kind of had a nice solid anise note all the way through. Uh, she enjoyed the sweetness that, that she felt came from the sarsaparilla. Um, she says that the lavender is great on the nose, a little less pronounced on the palate. Um, it, juniper is definitely not the major flavor profile, even though it's a gin. It's a little less pronounced. Um, she says, you know, the finish was nice, nice touch of oiliness, uh, orange cardamom. Um, and she actually likes making uh, uh, a gin mule out of it. That's how she likes to drink it, mm. which is an interesting yes. application. Yeah. And then uh, Christine said, immediately spicy and lively. Uh, juniper has a nice round mouth filling quality cinnamon then the lavender turns a little more rose almost or magenta and then uh, the citrus comes through at the end and actually reminds her of grapefruit and um, you know that's interesting they're using a Spanish bittersweet orange peel not not a grapefruit um, so something along the lines of a Seville orange hmm. I I don't know where they're sourcing it but they there other than it's Spain. So am I guessing it's, it's the Seville variety of bitter orange. Um, but yeah, I actually, I, I see that. I totally get that. And then last but not least is Dr. Ann Brock. And Ann said strongly anise, one dimensional at the front. So the anise really takes the lead. She, she likes drinking with ice and soda. With that, let's move on to our third candidate of the day. 
which is going to be Leopold Brothers from right here in Denver, Colorado. So again, this Leopold Brothers has been around a long time. Um, he started, uh, I think, the year before I did. Uh, he actually started in Ann Arbor, uh, but was from Denver and relocated here, strangely, about the same time I relocated here. Um, he's, he's actually in Denver proper, where I'm west of Denver, about, about 30 minutes in the foothills of the Rockies. But this is the product. This is the first gin that, that, that he pushed out into the market. And Todd likes to do things a little different. So this particular product, Todd individually distills each botanical separately. And then he blends those distillates together to come up with his small batch gin. And again, it's a great product. It's been around for a long time now. Um, and there's a reason it's still around. He only does a small amount each year. Um, Let's see, how much is he doing now? So it's been around for, for 19 years. And I want to say he does like 500 bottles a year. So it is available in the UK and the US. And with that, Bernadette, what'd you think? Um, I thought this was a lovely little thing, actually. I don't know what I was expecting. I'm, I'm familiar with the Pomelo. Um, the nose is almost like this, um, like caramel, almost candied fruit kind of sweetness to it, which is beautiful. It's incredibly pleasant. It took me by surprise initially. I think I was thinking it would be a little, a little bit more tart. I don't know why, but it's lovely. It's really, really nice. Um, it's just, it's smooth throughout. I found, um, I think what I put in my notes really, and it sounds worse than I mean it, but it's like what it lacks in complexity, it makes up for in focus. It's really focused. I refer to it as a note to the pomelo. It's like it's really centered around it. You do have these other things going on, but it's 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 all about that. And I think yeah, it's a lovely little drink. Yeah, really like it. David, I think it's quite uh, unusual, particularly after we'd had some of the other ones that we tasted so far. It just shows the breadth of uh, gin that's being produced. Uh, I got a slight mineral quality on the nose, leafy and herbal, and kind of that herbal, slightly piney very slight bitterness but that too was generally my takeaway from the from the whole product um there's some fruitiness and a little floral note as well which from a mixing point of view immediately drew my sort of thoughts towards how would this work with red vermouth and so that could be negroni could be sweet martini could be martinez that's the kind of thing that i think would work quite nicely with this because it's got a good intensity as well I actually had a, Mar a, Mar a Martinez with this uh, two days ago, three days ago. Um, and it's, I, it, it works incredibly well for that cocktail. One of the things that Todd did when he, by isolating each botanical is if you distill botanicals together, you're going to get different chemical interactions that are going to give you different flavor profiles and combinations. Mm -hmm. What he wanted to do was control that in a different way than most gin distillers do and isolate the true distilled flavor of each of those botanicals and then blend. It's a different approach, but it's an approach that I think works incredibly well with this gin. So with that, let's take a look at what Alice had to say. So very subtle nose, spiritus, just a touch of understated citrus, uh, slight chocolatey notes, which, which I see as well. I think that's almost her interpretation of the minerality. Um, Creamy, the juniper comes through at the, at the back. Um, relatively simple and clean profile, surprisingly smooth with a rich mouthfeel. And yeah, it's, it's all of that, I think, anyway. Mm -hmm. and, and Christine said, um, bakery notes, Danish pastries, raisins, croissants, ice and sugar, suggestion of a pine forest. There's an earthiness from the juniper, juniper tucked away too. I didn't really get the pastry note, um, but I definitely got that earthiness. And that's one of the things I really like about this gin. Um, quite warming with a long finish that turned it with a nice dry spicy end. Um, and I totally love that about this gin. Um, she thinks it'd, it'd be really tasty in a, in a Gibson. And I've not tried it in a Gibson, but 
you know, sweeter, sweeter vermouth like a Dolan Bianco or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, uh, Anne Brock. Very sweet, violet and floral, perfumed, um, very heavy rose floral notes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All that. See, I think it's quite interesting how different um, people have been take very different things away from this. I think from lip from the Leopolds, like there seems to be lots of different things going on, and each individual is taking their own approach. I guess that's just everyone's personal palette, isn't it? Well, and, and that's what this is all about. Everybody has a different palette. Everybody's going to like something a little different. So someone not might not like one gin, but might like another gin. Uh, some gins are going to be more suited for certain cocktails and others for certain people. And that's really, you know, each distiller needs to take and figure out a product that is uniquely their own, but that has a broad enough appeal to make it commercially viable. And all the gins behind me that we've selected are gins that, are, that have, that are unique, that are different, that are sometimes very unique but they have stood the test of at least a decade. And with the exception, I think few, few breakfast gin, I think is a little younger than that, but you know, but they're getting broad market appeal, especially with the bartenders and with gin drinkers, but none of these are a carbon copy of, you know, a classic old school London dry that my father and grandfather drank, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the point, you know, craft distilling, modern distilling, everything's changing. I mean, we're even seeing the bigger, more established producers suddenly coming out with different interpretations of gin, when in some cases they hadn't come out with new products in years or decades. Mm. And that was actually exactly the point uh, that was made when we were doing my tasting. It was the same thing there. It's great how many new gins are coming out. Um, a question on individual blending of separately distilled botanicals. Was it something that you ever thought of for your gin or have you ever considered doing it? Um, I've actually done it for uh, other people's gins and I've done it for um, other spirits for other people. I don't do it here. Um, actually, that's not true. I do do it here. So we, it's a technique that was used by uh, a, an Italian distiller that was a French nationalized citizen in the early to mid 1800s named Gaetien Picon. And so the classic liqueur Mer Picon in his original production format actually had several, several single botanical distillates that were blended together as components to make the final product. And we make, we, we, we make that formula here at Golden Moon. So we were following his instructions. It's the only thing we do that, that is not a, uh, it's not one of our own formulas. Um, and that's exactly what he did in the starting in the 1830s when he developed that product. Um, it's it's a technique that is one of many techniques in order to build gin and botanical spirits, and it's part of the distiller's toolkit. So it's appropriate. You know, you can isolate one botanical, distill it out, get that true flavor of that botanical, and then as you begin to build your spirit, use that as a component if you want a certain result but then you can take the same botanical, do it with other botanicals, either in an instill maceration or through a vapor basket macer uh, distillation and, or a variety of other ways. It's a tincture, for example, um, and you're going to get a different result just by the different way you're using the same botanical to build a gin. And so every gin behind me has taken a little different twist on that. And with that, I believe we are now at St. George. And that's a great intro to St. George because St. George Terroir, which is one of my favorite products by, by the guys at St. George, Lance and Dave were great distillers. I've been drinking their products for years. Um, terroir was very specifically designed to try and capture a place and a moment in time. And that place is Mount Tam, which overlooks San Francisco. Uh, it is an amazing place to go hiking and just the smell of the place is so cool. And that's what they wanted to try and capture in this gin. It's a very different approach. And so we just talked about different techniques of extraction and single botanical distillations and et cetera. 
So what Dave and Lance do, or Lance and Dave do, however you want to slice it, um, at St. George, is they take and they use multiple different techniques of extraction. So some botanicals are, are vapor basket extracted together, and some are instill macerated together. And then they blend that back together, and that's how they make this product, and they get the, the various flavor components built up in just the exact way they want them. So this is the product. It's one of many gins that, that the folks at St. George make. I kind of love their labels. It's got the California bear on it. And, they, and they've succeeded. I mean, I, and, and like I said, I drink this gin all the time. So um, it does smell like Mount Tam. And that's what they wanted it to smell like. It's really a place and a moment in time. And it's going to be totally different than any other gin that we've tasted today. So Bernadette, what do you think? Yeah, I'm um, so happy to talk about St. George. Um, I was on a flight to um, oh, I was on a flight to Washington a few years ago, and I spoke to somebody about you know good American gins, and St. George was the first one. They said it's quite a renowned distillery, isn't it? Really. Um, well, so and, along, um, along with Anchor, they were one of the earlier craft distilleries. Um, I mean, literally in the, in like the first 10 craft distilleries, I think they were the second or third wow. in the U S if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I may be wrong about that. If I remember correctly, that's the case. So they've been around a long time and they do things their own way. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason they're still around. Absolutely. Um, the, the, the idea of, of the Tara, I just, I'm so behind it because I think when you're, you're drinking a drink if you drink a gin that is good and it's made well and it tastes nice that's one thing um but if you're drinking a drink that evokes a place and a time like you said it's a whole different experience you're having the ex experience of being somewhere and you're paying for that experience as much as you're paying for just you know having a nice drink and these guys do it so wonderfully it's this is it's such a fragrant and complex spirit and there's so much going on there there's this cool menthol on the nose there's this pepperiness the sage comes through lovely and it's just a, it's a delight it's a real delight to experience so i'm a, I'm a big fan of this um my, my notes were tara done well it's complex it's evocative it, it's very it's very evocative and um, i think for drinks um a martini a negroni or maybe just an easy GNT, I think, with something like this. Yeah, lovely. David? Yeah, well, I think um, not only is it a great tasting gin, but the concept's really strong as well. Um, and these days, like the idea of incorporating some locally sourced botanical or a botanical that's evocative of a particular local area is very common. Like, this is a pretty standard thing for people in gin to do today. But it wasn't when they started doing it. And that's kind of the exciting thing. Um, and the other quite exciting thing is this year, I went um, to this area of, of California that sort of inspired it. And I always enjoyed the gin anyway. And now I enjoy it even more because I'm like, oh, I totally get it now. This is, there's all these, <laughs> these trees around, these redwoods and all this kind of, and you think, yeah, it's, this, is, this is totally it. So it's bold, it's resinous. Some of the uh, gins uh, that are less classic they might not be so resinous they might not be so junipery you cannot say this about st george toa it's beautiful it's pine blossom there's sort of a, some jammy notes going on with it um lots of juniper woody uh it's a negro i mean it's good in so many things but it's a negroni it's superb in a negroni maybe with a little sprig of rosemary i love rosemary anyway but beautiful fantastic spirit and the distiller's got a fantastic name david smith <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, and by the way, he just had a baby. So congratulations, Sam. Oh, congratulations, Sam. congratulations. So um, let's go to Alice's comments. She said the nose was fresh and floral, a little bit of violet. Uh, and this is one of the things that she caught that I think is hugely important. Mount Tam is on the California coast. And so the nose actually has a nice saline or sea salt note coupled with the juniper. And that really, that's absolutely true. I mean, when you're standing on Mount Tam, 
you're, you're getting the breezes off the Pacific Ocean. And that's the nose you get off this gin, which is just awesome. I um, you know, it's, this gin just, I couldn't tell I love this gin. I, I mean, I, I like every gin. <laughs> I like it. I love it. All right. Um, <laughs> Christine said, so she said it's immediately herbaceous, lost early spice, spices, clear Douglas fir, junipers permanent too. And this is the line that really sums it up for me in her write up. Makes you feel like fresh air in an actual forest. Mm. Yep. I, yeah. What else do you say after that? And then let's see what Anne had to say. Intense pine, really smooth. That's it. Feels like a forest to her, yeah. which is which is what they were going for. It's yeah. the it's the coastal forest of Northern California. It's so any, anything else about this gin? I'm just so glad you included it. I completely understand why you included it. It's a special thing, isn't it? It absolutely is, and you know, especially thing. when you look at when it was created and what was going on in the distilling world, mm -hmm. this was something that was groundbreaking, and it's something that, you know, I like I said, I've tried with the rest of the gins that that, that we curated for this. To, to pick gins that were unique and exemplified American craft gin production, um, but that have stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. And this one absolutely has. And I think for me, part of why I like this particular gin so much is I grew up in the High Sierra, which is on the California Nevada border, about four hours from San Francisco. And I spent a lot of time as a child visiting friends almost every month in San Francisco and actually hiking on Mount Tam. Mm. And so smell in particular, it has very cognitive impressions to people. And so for me, this gin brings up some really cool memories mm. that it's are instantly it's triggered it's when I smell it. it. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's like, just like David, just like you said at the start of this, that you know, now that you've visited this part of the world, you enjoy it more yep. because you get it. So the lesson there for for the gin producers in the audience and for that matter for the for the bartenders in the audience as well is when you build your gin when you build your cocktails triggering on certain things that evoke memories is really important you know come up with a flavor profile that that has meaning to your your customers to your consumers you know this gin was launched in san francisco in the original audience were people that woke up every morning and looked out and saw Mount Town, yeah. which is brilliant. Yeah. All right, so let's move on to the next one. So the next one is a gin out of Chicago uh, by a distillery owned by a man by the name of Paul Letko. Uh, again, one of the earlier craft producers here in the United States. This is the gin. Uh, Few has a very good presence in the UK and the global market. He makes a wide variety of gins, but the reason I wanted to select this gin, uh, and this is probably the newest, if you will, as far as when it was created, gin of the six, but the reason I wanted to create this gin was, was they really wanted to create a breakfast gin, hence the name breakfast gin, and they looked at botanicals that would resonate with an early morning gin, and they looked at coffee, they looked at a, br a bunch of teas, uh, a few other botanicals, and they settled on Earl Grey. Again, totally different than anything else we're going to taste today. Um, I literally, so I was in London, the last time I was in London was January, right before, the end of January, right before everything got really, really, really weird. And that was the first time I'd ever tasted this gin. I'd heard about it. And I was sitting in a bar talking to, to the bar owners. And um, they said, well, you know, we just got this in. Have you tried it yet? I said, no. They poured me a glass neat. And then they, we made a few cocktails with it. And it's just a really cool product. Uh, really delightful, made by a distillery that's been around for a long time that does a bunch of really cool things. So I've included it here. And I'd love to hear your thoughts, Bernadette. Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. Um, I quite like Few. That was one of the earlier American gins I tried, but not this one. Um, so I was keen to try this one. Um, mm -hmm. And it's it's really interesting. So it's kind of got this, with the bergamot, you've got this kind of dry sort of hay, sort of musty tea nose, which almost 
is a little bit malty. It comes across like a little bit malty, and I really like that. And again, even that element goes well with this idea of, of breakfast. And I, I love that side of it because I tried one over here a few years ago, and it had that. I just I just find that a very unusual way to go and it's becoming more so now but it, it just works so brilliantly there's a subtlety and this woodiness to the flavor um and you just get this little pang of zest which I, I really really enjoy um I find on the finish it's quite short and it falls away and you're left with just this little bit of residual dryness this, this woodiness and it just stays with it um it's cohesive body elements work really well and I found interestingly actually which you don't I don't see it a lot. It's so loud on the nose. You get this boom on the nose. And it's like through the whole journey from moving into the palette and the flavour and onto the finish, it just dissipates really slowly. So it's like you've had this initial burst and then it just quietens softly. And I just, yeah, I think it's lovely. And I'd be perfectly fine to drink this for breakfast. <laughs> I'd probably drink this. I'd probably stick to something like a martini because it's got quite a bold flavour and I'd be interested as to what the move would do with this. So I'd probably do a martini with this. I can tell you <laughs> that I've, I've drunk more than a few perfect martinis with this. Yeah. And I use Dolan, Dolan Blanc vermouth, equal okay. parts. Yeah. And with this gin, I prefer a nice little, a nice little hunk of orange zest as a garnish where I normally do my perfects with lemon. Sounds and the good. orange kind of ties into the bergamot a little bit. Um, yeah. I really like this gin in a perfect martini. Mm, good stuff. David? <laughs> it doesn't surprise me that the Earl Grey and the gin works well together. Um, I've been a fan of occasionally sort of infusing a little bit of gin with Earl Grey for like a gin tonica style sort of drink, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I remember trying this uh, when it came out a few years ago and it's, it's a fantastic product. I think um, there's simplicity in the flavors that are there because I don't think there's a huge amount of botanicals in there, but you've, you're getting some of those marmalady notes. You're getting the Earl Grey sort of notes. Um, and it, is, it does what it says it's meant to be doing. In terms of um, a drink, as, <laughs> as is meant to be at breakfast, and you, know, you might have a whole day of stuff to do, <laughs> I don't know, about martini. <laughs> but I mean, it's maybe a small one. Um, I... Quite, I, I, was work, I played around with it a bit um, before and came up with a sort of marmalade Colin. So some of the gin, a little bit of marmalade for the sweetness and then quite a lot of ice and then like a decent chunk of sparkling water. So it brings the ABV down a little bit. But that's quite nice. It's sort of nice sort of spritz to go with the morning. And uh, in my experience, it tastes very good when eaten with kippers. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't tried that one. Yeah. All right, so, so let's talk about what Alice had to say about this one. So she said it was warming, aromatic spice, sweet tea. I love the word mouthwatering. Alice, that's a great word in, her, in, in tasting notes. Um, she said the flavors had a little bit of a moonshine touch to it. And I think a lot of what few does with their gins have, have that distinct sort of, a, of a, a, a little bit of a hot distillate note that I rather like as a distiller. You know, too often people tend when they build spirits to try and hide the fact that it's a spirit. Mm. I actually think, especially if you're going to use it in cocktails, just like the higher ABV, I think you want a little heat or a little sharpness to really pay homage to the fact that you're drinking a, a distilled spirit. You know, that's that's part of the experience. So I think, I think that they've done that incredibly well with us. She called it right out in her notes, which I think is wonderful. She also thinks it would be good in a martini. Christine said, lemongrass, aromatic coriander spring out first, lively Earl Grey tea, which we've seen. She says it, it has a vanilla sponge cake mix note to it, which I, I didn't think about that. But now that she said it, that sounds pretty accurate. Um, some darker florals, a little bit of mint sneaks in. Um, she says it would be great in any light citrus forward cocktails. It's light, it's fresh, and it does what it sets out to do. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, the other thing I was going to say is gin highball, which is what David said with a little bit of marblade in it. Um, and then last but not least, uh, Anne calls out Steve, uh, Stephen Kaplan, who's their distiller. 
and he says, you know, he wanted to make a, a perfect morning gin, and that's what he's done. Um, subtle gin notes overlay with soft apple and pear, sweet, citrus, and creamy. Um, she likes it, and she recommends a gin fizz. A gin fizz or a Ramus fizz, which I've not tried, might be really neat with us. Mm -hmm. You know, that Earl Grey note on, on, in a classic gin fizz could be cool. I think I'm going to have to try it. All right, so I think we're down to one gin left, right? Yeah, last but not least. All right, all right, let's do this. So ladies and gentlemen, this is my gin. Um, I want to say first that this is the only gin I didn't select for the panel. Uh, the Gin Guild selected this and they, when they asked me to chair the panel. Um, I'm very flattered that they did. Um, I think I'd rather let you guys talk about the gin and then I can, I can chime in, et cetera, rather than, you know, I'm very biased about my own cooking, if you will. <laughs> I make things that I like to consume, whether, and, and I used to be a saucier, I'm a trained cook. Um, I'm very biased about what I cook. I like this. Otherwise I wouldn't, if I didn't like it, I wouldn't sell it. I wouldn't make it. So with that, um, Bernadette, if you would please and be kind. <laughs> no pressure. No. <laughs> so I love this. I love this gin. It's it's incredibly distinctive and it has bags of character and it's generous and it's easy to sip. On the nose, there's there's a subtle spice and there's a gentle warmth. And I got these really sort of sweet flavours like fudge and mint and murray mint and um that Murray Mint kind of stuck with me. I don't think you ever had a Murray Mint, Steve. I've actually think... never had Murray Mint. No, they're kind of like, it's almost like this ca hard caramel with a little bit of mint to it. Mm -hmm. And um, it's definitely a little bit of that going on in there. It's fragrant, it's herbaceous. On the finish, you get these aspects of menthol and eucalyptus, and it's bold and it lingers. And I, I love that too. It's, um, I... It, yeah, it's it's very different in a really beautiful way. It's a lovely thing. Um, I would try, what would I drink this in? A south side, maybe? Just because right. I'm sort of picking up on the mint going on there. I'd probably try this and that. And it's a lovely thing. Thank you. It's really nice. I paid her to say all that, folks. <laughs> I'll take a check, please. <laughs> David? Um yeah, I, I get um, a very sort of gentle sort of sweetness on the nose. There's floral and then there's little bits of sort of anise and fennel, which I guess is what I'm associating with the the, the sweetness there. Um, and then I get, when I'm on the taste, there's a slight earthy floralness. I get a little salinity. Um, there's, of course... Um, lavender but it's not just lavender there's violet and irish and licorice and there's some slightly rooty notes there's a sort of old world feel to it mm. um it just partly with the sweetness reminds me of like these sort of old school sweet shops and but there's something sort of ancient but also somewhat um reminiscent on it you know you recognize it a little bit in in terms of how uh, I would drink it, I think a French 75 would work really nicely um, mm. and quite possibly a last word. I feel like that slightly sort of floral rooty note would work well with the complexity of a green chartreuse and then that sort of sweetness from the maraschino as well. Mm. Maybe a Piccadilly, which has a little bit of absinthe in it as well. Mm. I, made, I made a riff on the last word, a historical riff called the written word the other night, which has uh, Curacao instead of Maraschino. Nice. And I used Argenape instead of Chartreuse because it was on my home bar. And, um, and that is an utterly delightful cocktail um, with my gin. But then again, I'm biased, right? <laughs> so let's read through the other notes. And then let me give you guys the backstory on how I developed it and why. Um, I mean, you know, they asked me to, to curate this as a distiller. So I had to talk about how I built it, right? Of course. All right, so Alice had uh, said um, supernaturally sweet, maybe sweetened. Um, yes, Alice, there is a touch of sugar in this. Uh, but the sugar was not added for sweetness, and it does not actually sweeten it. It was added for mouthfeel, and it's about 10 grams per liter in the final product, mm -hmm. uh, much the same way that grappa has a touch of sugar at the, in the final product. And it actually gives it a little bit of that more viscosity, which is what I was looking for. 
Um, some commercial gin producers use, use glycerin for that. I prefer to use a natural cane sugar, um, but not enough to change the sweetness. Most of the sweetness from this actually comes from the botanicals themselves. And specifically, I think a lot of the sweetness in this gin comes from the Egyptian or Turkish fennel that we use. Mm -hmm. So what else did she have to say? Um, tannic black tea, that actually comes from the hyssop, which has a lot of tannins in it. We use hyssop in this, in this product. Processed sweet licorice, uh, that actually comes again from the Turkish or Egyptian fennel that we use. Um, and strangely, she says not much juniper. Uh, half the people that taste this think it's a juniper bomb, half think it doesn't have enough. And that's fine. <laughs> Everyone's got a different palate. Um, she says uh, a little alcoholic burn. Again, it's 45. I want people to taste the alcohol. I believe the higher proof makes a better cocktail. That's something I, I literally took from drinking Junipero 20 some odd years ago, um, which is one of the reasons that Junipero is on the back table here. Um, a little mentholic. So we use a, we use a variety of uh, field mint and mint balm here, or lemon balm here. Uh, no true commercial mint at all. And so the, the mint inputs are actually there for, for citrus and mint notes. There's no citrus in this at all. That all comes from the lemon balm which is a mint. Um, so you're getting multiple flavors, citrusy notes, mint notes, et cetera, from a member of the mint family. It's not a peppermint or a spearmint or et cetera. Um, just to call that out. Um, very smooth, subtle coriander. Now I, I added coriander in, in this because I love that spice. I love that peppery note. And I think it really balances out. Coriander for you distillers, it's always going to come in on the back end of a gin if you use it. It's always, that's where it's going to show up on the palate for the most part, if you use the coriander seed. Now you can use the leaves, which is also known as cilantro, and the essential oils you extract from the leaves are going to come up in the front of the mid palate. I didn't want that in this. They're going to be more herbaceous. I wanted that spice from the coriander on the back end. So let's see what Christian said, or Christine said, sorry. Aniseed is immediately apparent. Uh, it's not aniseed, it's fennel, but okay. Um, and that's their, they both, they both carry anethol as, 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 a, as a chemical, it's a flavor, a, a flavor component. Um, everybody says that this has, that this has cardamom and anise in it when they taste it. Neither are in the gin, <laughs> but the same chemicals are in the gin from other inputs. So, um, along with lavender type florals, fresh mint leaf, coriander's in there too. Uh, the mint really comes to the fore along with the florals. Um, she thought there might be rose in this. Uh, it's actually all uh, what's known as French ultra grade uh, culinary lavender that we source in the south of France. Uh, they do grow lavender closer to us here in Colorado, but it's very different and it wasn't the flavor input that I was looking for. And that's important. You know, going local is only good if it gives you the results you want. And I wanted a certain combination of flavors with this particular gin. And the lavender I was getting in Colorado just did not have the, it didn't have the right oomph. It didn't have the right flavor I was looking for. Mm -hmm. So I went and found where it was. And that's where I sourced my lavender from. She says the finish is really spicy, which is the coriander among other things, and really long. And she wants to try this in a mojito. And I have to be honest here, I sort of have, sort of haven't, but I think I need to make one. Yeah, immediately. <laughs> I make lots of cocktails with this, but I've never really thought of you just taking a straight mojito recipe and yeah. substituting this for a white rum. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's been in the 90s here in Colorado, and that sounds like, that sounds like this Saturday, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> um, and last but not least, let's see what Ann had to say about it. Beautifully complex tarragon and pine with soft citrus. Um, I get that. I think that lemony note that you get off of tarragon is, is, what, is what we're getting off of the lemon balm. Um, she suggested a white Negroni, and I've made white Negronis with this, and I think that's a fine idea as well. Mm. So what else, what else do you guys think about this, Jen? I mean, it's mine. You can, you can be rough if you want. I'm fine with that. I'm thick-skinned. <laughs> People have been buying this for over a decade, so I think I think you know, 
if people are going to keep buying it. I was just going to just maybe ask, I suppose if, if we're thinking about distillers watching this, what gave you the initial ideas with this recipe? What, when you started getting the first ideas for what botanicals you wanted to use, where, where did that inspiration come from? I started distilling uh, just about 30 years ago. And I started, I, I was a brewer, and I started making, uh, to be blunt, really lousy single malt. I make reasonably good single malt now. I keep winning awards with it. But in those days, 30 years ago, not so much. And I was really heavily focused because I came out of the beer world on grain whiskeys. Um, and mostly, mostly single malts, uh, mostly mashing like an American single malt distiller typically does. I don't do that anymore. And that is it. We mash, most American distillers mash like a brewer. Mm -hmm. And so I did that for a while. And then I, uh, I was planning on, uh, when I got out of graduate school, uh, opening, doing a fundraise, opening a distillery and Fritz Maytag, uh, who owned Anchor, who's Junipero is behind me, uh, sat me down and said, you need to wait five years. The regulations haven't caught up. You don't have the resources I have. You need to wait five years. Take classes, learn, visit distilleries, do everything you can to increase your skill set and your palate. Mm -hmm. But go out, get a real job, build a resume, learn how to run a business. And so I did that, and I didn't really totally walk away from distilling, but I sort of did. I mean, I still was fascinated by it and taking classes and reading. And, and then I discovered absinthe. And I went way, way down the rabbit hole <laughs> and so, sort of became uh, what in the absence world is known as an h -er. Um and It's funny because I never considered myself an h -er until I was sitting about six years ago at Tails with a bunch of other absinthe distillers. And I mentioned that I wasn't and they all kind of looked at me and said, you were right there with us. What are you nuts? <laughs> um, in fact, I want. I want to say it was Ted Bro that owns Jade Absinthe that made the comment. Um, and so these were illicit absinthe distillers around the world that uh, a lot of them were incredibly kind in showing me and taking me under their wing to teach me how absinthe historically were built and how they were making them in the modern era. And how, and really it was a great learning experience for me as a botanical distiller. And at this point in my career, I'm so much known as a, botan a, a botanical distiller that recently when, when I, I took an award in San Francisco for one of my whiskeys, a blogger came out and said, botanical master distiller Stephen Gould tries his hand at whiskey. Now I've been making whiskey for 30 years. I've only been making gin for about 12. I've only been making absinthe for about 15. So I've been making whiskeys a lot longer, but so I went down the absinthe rabbit hole and I started collecting rare booze, which I've done for a couple of decades now. And I don't typically sell any of it off, but sometimes I, I'm asked to be involved in deals. And we acquired a large cache of spirits that were known as the Hannisville cache. And it was mostly rye whiskey from 1863 with a bit of bourbon and a few other things, including a carboy of gin. And I tasted the gin, which I thought would be horrible. And it was the most amazing gin I had ever tasted. And I had a deal with my business partner. The gin was broken up into samples and it was sold uh, on the collector's market. And I stupidly did not keep any sample for myself. I drank everything I had and it just stuck with me. And so I started researching. I was already building a library of rare books on distillation. I now have a massive library of rare books on distillation. And so I started looking historically on how gins were put together in the 17 and 1800s. Now this gin was somewhere 1860s, 1870s gin. And what I very quickly realized was two things. It was a medicinal gin. It was probably put together more for sale through a pharmacy than for sale to the, you know, at the local bar. And the recipes for that style of gin that I was able to find from that period of time 
all look strangely like absinthe recipes without wormwood and with juniper. And they were put together the same way. So much so that I looked at my research bench and realized that I had most of the botanicals I needed to begin prototyping without having to go source them. And I had juniper in my backyard. So I had juniper communis on a tree. So I literally thought about this gin that inspired me and the flavors I wanted to put into it and did a couple of prototypes and came up with the formula that we have for Golden Moon today. So it's not, a, it's not what anyone would view as, a, as a, a gin that is traditional in taste or style that fits into the major categories that we, know, that we all know today. It's not a London Dry. It's certainly not a Plymouth. Um, it's not a New Western. Um, it's not an Old Tom. It's something else. And it really is what I like to refer to as a historical medicinal style of gin. Um, it's very thick, it's very herbaceous. Uh, we use solely in still maceration for this product, which means that we're taking the botanicals and we're putting them in the still and we're, and we're doing a cold maceration uh, for, for about 24 hours. Uh, and then we're doing a single shot production. So we do a distillation, we deproof it, we bottle it, we're done. Uh, we had a touch of sugar in the deproofing process. Um, a lot of your bigger brands are also doing instill maceration. Uh, Beef Eaters comes to mind, only they're doing a multi shot. So they're taking, they're distilling it much the same way we distill this, only then they blend in additional spirit to stretch the production of the stills because their stills are rather small compared to their volume. And it works great. There's a reason Beef Eaters is the largest brand on the planet. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a very old school way of making gin. Um, it's a very straightforward way of making gin. Uh, we don't have a huge number of botanicals. Uh, we go very much for, for heavy, heavy levels of essential oil extraction, both to add aroma and flavor and to, and to give it a thicker mouthfeel. Uh, for example, uh, I actually will freeze and break up my juniper berries which breaks down the collagen in the fruit and allows a much higher level of extraction than other gin producers typically will get off of their juniper uh, because it gives me the flavor that I wanted and it gives me the mouthfeel. And part of what's, what I like about this gin is that because of the high essential oil content, um, it gives it a softer mouthfeel, a creamier mouthfeel. And at the same time, it makes beautiful cocktails. You know, the higher level of essential oil, the higher the alcohol content, the better cocktail you're going to get in the end, unless you overdo it and then you ruin it. And that is where the artistry of being a distiller comes in, right? Yeah, lovely. Good explanation. That's wonderful. Thank you. Certainly. You know, and this is to the audience, one of the things that I love about teaching courses like this is the interaction with the audience and especially with working distillers and bartenders they ask questions and I learn from that interaction. So I'm really sorry that today we don't have that, but I'm hoping that everybody likes what I had to say about my gin and enjoyed the other gins as well. They're all amazing products. So David, what, what else you got? <laughs> I think that's it, CBG. I mean, you've covered a lot of ground, um, but no, I, th I yeah, I, I think I, I totally agree with you. I think we've had some very good quality gins. I think there's a lot of great gins that are um, available in the US and what has uh, inspired a lot of people in the UK. Certainly, I know a lot of the distillers that I've worked with have been in the UK, have been inspired by what's been going on in the US by people that are, have been going for several years like yourself. And then also, you know, all the work with things like ADI and that have done as well. Meet so many different people that are doing so many exciting things. So, um, You know, if anybody out there, whether you're a distiller or a bartender, has any questions for me, um, please uh, feel free to reach out. It's goldenmoondistillery.com. Um, you know, I used to give a lot of classes. Right now, we haven't been. We've been pretty busy with my expansion. Uh, I'm also master distiller for a large Irish whiskey operation part-time, and that's been 
taking up a lot of my time. Um, but if I can answer questions, uh, if I can give you any advice or point you in the right direction on anything, please reach out to me and say hello. Um, if you're really bored late at night and have nothing better to do, you can also go out on YouTube. And I have a nice little uh, cocktail YouTube series called The Distiller's Basement. Uh, YouTube search for distiller apostrophe S basement. Uh, and you'll come up with me if you don't put the apostrophe in, you get the punk band. And while I think they're a great band, they're not gonna teach you how to make really cool cocktails and talk about really cool spirits. So I appreciate your time and listen to me kind of blather on and on and on. And, and David Bernadette, uh, thank you so much. Um, to the Gin Guild, thank you for inviting me and including my gin. Um, and thank you to our panel. You know, I appreciate it and I hope everybody else got something out of it. Thank you, Steve. My Good pleasure. Stuff. Everybody be well, be safe. I know things are crazy right now, but we will get through this. Absolutely. Cheers.